Whenever we're reading or hearing the word of God, it's more than just information that we're learning. It's not like a maths class or a physics class where you're learning, just learning, really learning and taking in information, even though that information might be very useful. When we're reading or hearing the word of God, it's actually changing us. It's changing our constitution spiritually. We're becoming more like what we're reading. It's a bit like planting a seed in the ground. That seed grows into a certain kind of plant. When we plant the seed of the word of God in our minds, in our hearts, in an invisible, often unseen way, we start growing into the thing that we've planted. So this is God's words, and to be taking in God's words and then growing into living God's words is a very powerful, deep, supernatural process, really. So always bear in mind, when you you read the word of God, it's more like eating food that then becomes who you are than it is simply taking information. If you eat an orange, pretty soon that orange is you. All the goodness from it has transformed into your cells and, and your body. And you are that orange. It's the same with the word of God. You you become what you read. It's well known that you become the things that you most spend your time thinking about and considering and watching. So as we listen to, hear the word of God, we're becoming, if we open our hearts to it, we're becoming the very thing that God is speaking to us through it. So with that in mind, let's say a prayer. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We pray, Lord God, that as, as we read your word and hear it this morning, Lord God, that indeed we'll be transformed and changed into the very truths that you are giving to us, Lord. That as we go through our week, Lord, and beyond, we will see the fulfillment, Lord God, of the things that we're learning about and discovering. We'll see it fulfilled in our own lives in amazing and marvellous ways. And we thank you, Lord, that when we receive your word with humility, Lord God, and and we welcome your word into our lives, we know that it will do its work in us. So Holy Spirit, please anoint what we have to say and listen to this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Speaking about overcoming the accuser, overcoming the accuser. So Isaiah chapter 37, verse 22. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. She despises you. She scorns you, the virgin daughter of Zion. She wags her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. Let me read that again. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. She despises you. She scorns you, the virgin daughter of Zion. She wags her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. Now, the Lord is speaking a word here about someone. And that someone, we we learn actually from earlier verses, is Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. This was a king who was coming against the people of Israel. So the prophet Isaiah uh, spoke to the king of Israel, Hezekiah, about Sennacherib and said the words that we've just read. So these words on the surface are about Sennacherib, the, the king that was opposed to and coming to destroy God's people. Hence why it says, this is the word the Lord has spoken concerning him. So isn't it interesting that suddenly the gender changes? in the statement itself. When the words of the Lord begin to be quoted, it's speaking about a female. She despises you. She scorns you. She wags her head behind you. So what does this tell us? Number one, it tells us that, yes, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, was scorning God's people, despising God's people, wagging his head behind them. In other words, mocking and threatening Yes, he was doing that, but there was something more operating in his life, operating behind his attack and his slander and his threats. And that's a spiritual power. Uh, We're told by the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians that our battle is not with flesh and blood, not with people, but with principalities and powers, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We all know that there's a physical world we can see, There's an invisible world that we can't see. You have a physical body, that is you, but you're a lot more than your physical body. There's the visible you, there's the invisible you. There's the visible world, there's the invisible world. There's visible powers, authorities, kings, rulers, armies. There's invisible powers, authorities, kings, rulers, armies. Some of those rulers and authorities are with God, angels, for example. Others of those rulers and authorities are with Satan 
And that's who our battle is actually with. So what's coming against Hezekiah, the king of Israel, at this time that we're reading in the form of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, as his enemy, is actually a spiritual power. And the Lord chooses in his words here to characterize that spiritual power in the female. She despises you. She scorns you. She wags her head behind you, O virgin daughter of Zion, daughter of Jerusalem. Now, who is this spirit mocking, scorning, threatening? She's threatening, or it is threatening, the virgin daughter of Zion, the daughter of Jerusalem. This is a symbolic way of speaking about God's people. This spirit, working through Sennacherib, is threatening, mocking, wagging its head behind God's people. And it's very significant that it's described as a she, because as far as we can tell, spirits don't have a gender. So why she despises you, why she scorns you, why she wags her head behind you? Because what she is, this demonic power, is the opposite of what the virgin daughter of Zion is, the daughter of Jerusalem is. God's people are beautiful. God's people are noble. God's people are full of his grace and his power and his love. That's the nature of God's people. God's people don't accuse. God's people don't slander. God's people don't threaten. But the spirit does. The spirits do. So what we see is the despising, the scorning, the wagging the head behind God's people is the exact opposite of what God's people are. And very often the lies and the attacks and the accusations even that the enemy, that the devil brings against you or brings against God's people is the very opposite of what's true. If you start hearing a voice in your head telling you, you know, there's no point in you being alive, that's the exact opposite of the truth. The exact opposite. The exact opposite is there's every purpose for you being alive. And I could spend all day here telling you what those purposes are without even necessarily knowing you very well. Or if you have a voice in your head telling you, there's no point getting up today. It's a waste of time. The exact opposite is true. There's every reason to get up, to get moving, to get engaged with your life and with those around you. So very often what the devil brings our way in the way of thoughts in our mind or voices through other people is the exact opposite of the truth. So we can often look at the lie in order to discover the truth. So here's Sennacherib or the spirit behind him despising God's people, scorning God's people, wagging her head, threatening God's people. And that's the exact opposite of the truth. God's people are loved. God's people are valued. God's people are safe in his power and his presence. Isn't that beautiful to be able to understand what we can see through those verses? And the reason I began this message with those verses is because you could Really, you could crystallize or simplify that whole, that, that whole verse into the term accusation. This king is coming against Israel with accusation, accusing God's people, the virgin daughter of Jerusalem, as being worthless, pointless, and ready to be destroyed. And that's the exact opposite of the truth. The accuser, the accusation that comes, and that's the job of the devil. And we're going to see that uh, more as we go along. And we need to understand that this, this spiritual battle that was going on back then in the time of Isaiah, that, yeah, that's historic, that's back then. But we're in the same kind of battles today in our own lives. The same spirits come against us as God's people, as came against them. And the same God is with us, giving us the same truths and the same tools to win, to overcome. Are you all with me so far? Following along? Good. So now we're going to the book of Revelation, chapter 12, beginning in verse 10. Final, final book of the Bible. And um, one that's attracted more and more and more attention in the last few years as the world has been changing so fast. And people begin to sense that many of the prophecies in the book of Revelation are being fulfilled. Uh, so many people who, who aren't Christian have begun reading the book of Revelation and trying to find out what it's all about. So here we are in Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 to 11. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, 
now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been cast down who accuses them before our God day and night. Let's stop there. The accuser of our brethren. Brethren means brothers and sisters. It means our brothers and sisters in Christ, the church, God's people. And there's someone or something that is described here as the accuser of our brothers and sisters. The one who comes with that pointing finger to say, you're wrong, you're bad, you're evil, you don't, there's no point to your life, whatever it is, those accusations. There's, a, there's an entity, there's something that's described here as the accuser of our brothers and sisters. And who do you think that might be? The devil. The devil, Satan. The word Satan means adversary or accuser in the original language. This is speaking about Satan. Satan comes to accuse. He comes to lie in a general sense, but he particularly comes to accuse God's people, to bring false accusations against God's people. But something's happening in this verse. We're told the accuser of our brothers has been cast down. Cast down. So this accuser has been thrown down from the place where it was. Defeated, in other words. Overcome. How's that happened? How's that accuser, how's that accusing voice been overcome? Well, the clue is in the next statement. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Someone or some group of people have overcome, have conquered the accuser. That's quite something to conquer the devil, to overcome the devil. That's quite something, right? That's quite an achievement. And someone's done it, or some group have done it. And who are the group who've done it? And how have they done it? But it's not speaking about God, and it's not speaking about angels. It's speaking about people. People who have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and because they loved not their lives unto death. This, to me, sounds like a description of a Christian. A Christian who knows... I am forgiven and I am clean because of the blood of Jesus was shed for me. I may have all kinds of issues in my life, but the bottom line is I'm forgiven, I'm clean. The blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God, Jesus, was shed for me and therefore I'm forgiven. There's no guilt on me, I'm clean. That's a Christian, that's you and me. And they've overcome him, conquered him by the word of their testimony. What's a testimony? A story, a story of something that has happened for you, something that you have experienced, something that's come about in your life. So this is a Christian. If you're a Christian, things have happened in your life that come from God, and you've got stories to tell about them. They might be big things, they might be small things. You have a testimony. Earlier on, I was talking to John here, and he began telling me about how he came to know Jesus Christ, a little bit of his story. It's a testimony. It's a story of his experience, what God has done for him. So it seems that one of the characteristics of a Christian is a Christian has a testimony, not just about how we came to know Christ, but about all the other good things that God has done in our life and is still doing. You have a testimony. And the way we can tell from these verses that these Christians have conquered, have overcome the accuser, is by, number one, their trust in the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Lord. I am clean. I am forgiven. There's no guilt on me because of the blood of Jesus shed for me. And number two, because of the word of their testimony. They are speaking about what God has done for them. If you and I speak about what God has done for us, what God is doing for us, what God has shown us, there's so much power in that that it contributes to throwing down the devil. It's not enough to just stand on the blood of the lamb and say, I'm clean, I'm forgiven. We have to add to that. And thank you, Lord, that you've done this for me. You've done that for me. This is my testimony. And really, for those who want to go a bit deeper on this subject of testimony, really the only testimony is Jesus Christ. Everything that has happened in your life that is good has come from Jesus Christ. He is the good. Everything. 
And so your testimony is actually Jesus Christ. Your testimony comes from Jesus Christ and what he's done and is doing in your life. And your testimony points to Jesus Christ. That's why when I go to preach on the streets here in Oswestry or in other places, I do often testify to what God has done for me. But where I always want to take things and where I often do take things is to point to Jesus. He's the one. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. He is the testimony. He is God's testimony to what God is like, his love for mankind and all of his wonderful purposes. Everything comes back to Jesus. So are you getting a picture? There's an accuser of the brethren, of the brothers and sisters. There's a devil who is constantly scorning, despising, threatening you personally, threatening the church, threatening nations, threatening the people that God has made, trying to steal, trying to kill, trying to destroy. There's an accuser. He comes with his lies to accuse. And he's been thrown down. Or he is thrown down. And he's thrown down by Christians. He's thrown down by Christians who do two things. Who stand in this truth. I'm clean by the blood of Jesus. And Jesus has done this for me. And is doing this for me. But there's something else, isn't there? There's three things, actually, in this list. They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb by the word of their testimony. And then would you all together with me read the next statement? For they loved not their lives even unto death. For they loved not their lives even unto death. Because these Christians he's talking about, because they were willing for it to cost them anything to stand in the truth that I'm clean by the blood of the Lamb, to stand and speak of what God has done, what God's doing, even if it cost them everything. They didn't love their life so much to say, you know, I'm too, I'm too concerned for my, my existence that I'm not going to take the trouble, have the courage to believe what Jesus has done for me and to speak about it. They love not their lives, even unto death. Now, to take that again a little further for those that wish to, in order to, so often, in order to stand on that ground of the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, it costs us, even in our own soul. I'll put it in the most simple example. You wake up in the morning and you feel like the worst person on earth. It can be a battle, right, to throw off those thoughts and to say, no, I refuse to live with that lie. It can be a battle. You actually have to die to those feelings in order to get up and get on with your day. You have to die to those lies, as if they're dead to you, in order to live in the truth. And so often, in order to live as the Christians that we are, knowing we're clean before God by his blood, standing in and promoting the word of our testimony, We have to die to emotions, feelings, thoughts, things that other people are saying to us, even our own sense of comfort at times. We have to get out there and fight. A battleground isn't always the most comfortable place to be. And there's a significant risk on a battlefield that you will die or be wounded or be injured. A significant risk. And we are on a battlefield. Our battle is not with flesh and blood. It's with principalities, powers, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's with the accuser who comes to despise, to scorn, to threaten. And how do we overcome him? How do we win the battle? How do we emerge victorious from that battlefield? Only if we go into it, allow, willing for it to cost us everything. Only if we go into it saying, whatever it costs me, I'm going to believe that the blood of Jesus has made me clean. Whatever it costs me, I'm going to thank God for what he's done in my life. However small or insignificant it may seem, I'm going to thank him. And actually, I'm going to tell someone else about it as well. Whatever it costs me, whatever it costs, going onto that battlefield, knowing this may cost me everything, but I'm doing it. I'm doing it with my whole heart. That's how the Christians, this body of Christians that are willing to live this way, 
throw down the accuser of the brethren. There's a book called The Art of War. You may have heard of it. It's by Sun Tzu, an ancient Chinese sage, The Art of War. I've only read excerpts, but one of the excerpts I read, he said, if you're going to go into battle, only go into it if you know that you're going to win. Only go into it if you know that you've got the capacity to win. And so the question is, do we have the capacity to see the accuser of the brethren thrown down in our personal lives, for the church, for the nations? Do we have the capacity? And are we going to see it happen? Absolutely. We have the capacity and we're going to see it happen. So this leaves us with a promise and it leaves us with a challenge. The promise is that the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ come when the accuser of our brethren is cast down and that he has been and will be cast down. And the challenge is that there's a way that he has to be cast down and it's through you and me. They conquered him. And the challenge is to go into that battle. Thank you, Lord. I'm clean by the blood of the lamb. Thank you, Jesus. This is what you've done for me and what you're, going, and what you're doing for me or those around me. And whatever it takes, I'm standing on that ground. I'm living on that ground. I'm fighting on that ground. Victory is guaranteed. Jesus has already defeated the enemy, Satan, the accuser. And we have the privilege of joining in with him in this victory in our daily lives. So, summing up so far, the devil, Satan, the word means the accuser, the adversary, the one who comes to accuse, to oppose. That's Satan, the adversary. He comes to accuse our brothers and sisters, Christians, the church, and he comes to threaten destruction. But by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and if we will love not our lives, even unto death, whatever it costs to stand on this ground and fight on it, then the accuser is thrown down. Those accusations have no more power. It's an amazing thing when you're accused of something and you stand up against that accusation. You refuse to believe it. You throw it out, no matter what, how hard that is emotionally. It's, very, it's an amazing moment when you sense that victory in your heart, that this accusation no longer has any power to trouble me, to threaten me, or to hold me back. Does that make sense? I'm sure we can all relate to one degree or another. Now, I'm kind of an all or nothing person. So if I was a different kind of person, I'd be stopping right now in this message and saying, you've had enough, you know, that's enough for one week. You know, go home and think about it. But I kind of think if you're going to sit down for a meal, it should be a good one. And it should, you, should, you should get up satisfied. So I'm going to go on and just illustrate from the scriptures a couple of occasions where the accuser of the brethren actually appears and we see what he's doing to give you some more meat to what I've just been talking about. Are we all up for the second course? Yep, not, not full already? Okay, good. So let's carry on eating the word of God, which transforms us as we believe it and receive it. But the next verse is Job, chapter 1, verses 6 to 12. I love the book of Job. It's my favorite book in the Bible. It's about a man, a very, very, very good man, against whom the devil came to destroy him, to accuse him and to destroy him. And the devil failed. Great story. We're just going to jump in on a couple of verses at the very beginning of the book. So Job chapter one, verse six. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there's no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? 
Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. You're getting a glimpse there into heaven. You're seeing a meeting, a reunion, a gathering. And who's at this meeting? The Lord God and the sons of God who come to present themselves before him. And amongst those sons of God is Satan. I wonder how he appears when he appears before God. The Bible says that he disguises himself to look like an angel of light. I wonder if he appears to be a son of God as he comes before God. We don't know, but what we do know is that he comes before God and he comes before God to accuse God's people. That's what we read in Revelation, that he accuses God's people day and night. He accuses them to God. And when he comes to God in this story, the Lord actually asks him a question. Where have you you come from? And he says, I've come from going up and down on the earth, walking to and fro on it. What's he doing when he's walking to and fro on the earth? He's looking someone to accuse. He's finding someone who he can accuse. Even more than that, the Bible tells us that Satan roams to and fro like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for someone to devour, someone to destroy, someone to eat up. And he'll use the tactic of accusation to begin to do that. If someone brings an accusation against you, it can completely stop you in your tracks. It can make you feel paralyzed. It can make you think that, begin to wonder if it's true. That's the first step to being devoured, to your life shrinking into nothing, if you believe it. So Satan looks for someone. He's looking for someone who's going to, be, who's going to receive those accusations, someone who's going to let those accusations lead on to destruction. That's what he's doing, going up and down, looking for those kind of people. So it's amazing how God actually says to him, well, have you thought about this chap? Have you considered my servant, Job? There's no one else like him on the whole earth. He's upright, he's blameless. This is one good man. So the Lord actually is almost feeding Satan an opportunity. Why do you think the Lord's saying this to to, 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 to Satan? It seems so that Satan can go ahead and then start accusing him. Because that's exactly what happens next. Satan begins to say to to the Lord, look, the reason Job fears you is because of all the good things you've done for him. You're protecting him, you're blessing him. That's that's the reason he loves you. That's That's the reason he fears you. But if you take away what you've given him, he won't fear you anymore. He'll curse you instead. Very subtle. Accusation here. He's actually, what's he accusing Job of? He's accusing Job of not actually loving God. He just loves what God's giving him. Not real love. We call it cupboard love here in England. Cupboard love. It's the kind of love which is just your dog has for you. Maybe that's a bit cruel. Sorry. It's the kind of love that the dog has when all it really wants is the treat or the food. You think it loves you, but actually it just wants the food. That's cupboard love. That's what Job, Satan is accusing Job of having. He just serves you because of what you're doing for him. It's not real love. It would be horrible to be in a relationship where you knew that the other person, the only reason they were in it was for what they could get out of you. Horrible. And that's what Satan is accusing Job of being. That kind of person. Accusation. And so the Lord gives him permission. Okay, go ahead. Touch what he has. And as the story goes on, we see that Satan does come and destroy a lot of what Job has. And so Satan goes out to do that. We'll pick up the story now in chapter 2, verse 1. Having gone and destroyed all of Job's property, all of his children, Satan comes back to Job. Satan comes back to God. Here we are, chapter 2, verse 1. And there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. So the gathering is happening again. The reunion is happening again. 
And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. So he's up to the same old things. That's what he's always doing, going up and down on the earth, looking for someone to accuse, someone to devour. That's what the accuser, the adversary does. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. So we're getting a bit of deja vu here, a bit of a repeat performance. Where have you been? I've been going looking for someone to devour. Oh, have you thought about my servant Job? He's, he's the most upright man on the earth. But then the Lord adds in something new. Even though you incited me to allow you to destroy all his blessings or most of his blessings, he still, he still holds fast to his integrity. That's amazing, isn't it? Then the, Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, all that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. So now Satan comes with the next accusation. Okay, granted, he, did, he wasn't loving you just for the blessings of property and children and so on. But he does only serve you for the blessing of having his own life. You start threatening a man's own life. You'll soon find out what he values. Touch his food, touch his health, touch his closest relationship. You'll soon find out. And that's what Satan's accusing Job of. He's saying, look, okay, he's, he's willing to put up with having, having a lot taken away from him. He won't continue to serve you, God, to fear you if you actually take away his, his own life, his health. And so the Lord says, okay, go ahead, just don't kill him. And what happens next, if you know the story, Satan comes and he afflicts Job with terrible illness and, and boils and so on, to the point where even his wife is encouraging him just to curse God and, and die. Very tough, very, very incredible trial. The point I wanted to bring up through bringing up those verses is that there's Satan, there's the accuser, right there in the presence of God, claiming that Job has no integrity, that he really doesn't love God, that he really doesn't fear God. And God decides to prove the point. He proves the point by allowing the accuser to damage Job and his life. But by the time you get to the end of the book, you find that God knew all along that Job was exactly what God had said him to be, a blameless man, an upright man who fears God and actually we see he loves God. When the accuser comes to God speaking about you, he's saying the same things. This person doesn't really love you. This person doesn't really fear you. They don't really serve you. They're not really, they're bad. That's what he's saying, they're bad. And God has an answer for that. But the answer is what we read in Revelation. The answer is Jesus Christ. We're clean by the blood of the Lamb. We have a word of testimony of what Jesus has done in our lives and what he's continuing to do. And we play our part too. We love not our life unto death. Whatever it takes, we follow Jesus. We honour Jesus. We love him and we stand in the truth, the glorious truth of what he's done for us and what he's going and what he's doing for us. Thus we overcome the accuser. Does that make sense? Final little passage, shorter one. This is another appearance of the accuser before God. Zechariah chapter three, verses one and two. Now this occasion and the occasion we just read in Job are the only two places in the scripture that we have an actual story told about when the accuser comes before God to accuse God's people. So they're really giving us a glimpse into heaven and what goes on there. And Zechariah is being given a vision at this point. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is not this a brand 
plucked from the fire. So we have a vision of heaven, what's going on there. And Zachariah is seeing Joshua. At the time, the high priest was Joshua. And he's standing before the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is the way the Bible describes Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord. So you have Joshua standing before Jesus. When you pray, you're standing before Jesus in the heavenly places. Yes, your body is here on earth. But you, in your spirit, you're standing before Jesus. So it's interesting that Joshua is standing before Jesus in this, standing before the angel of the Lord. But there's someone standing at his right hand. Who is that individual? Satan. And Satan was standing at his right hand. What does the word Satan mean? Accuser. And therefore we're told Satan was standing at his right hand to accuse him. What a picture. There's Joshua standing in front of Jesus and on his right hand, right there in heaven, is Satan accusing Joshua, wanting to accuse him. When you pray, when you spend time praying to God, you're standing before Jesus. Sometimes there'll be an accusing voice coming into your mind. What right have you got to approach God? Look what you thought yesterday. Look what, how you failed last week. Look, you know, all I could go on and on with the litany of accusations that can come. Satan standing right there to accuse you. You're not worthy to be standing before God. So what happens then? This is so beautiful and powerful. Verse two, and the Lord said to Satan. So the Lord responds directly to Satan on behalf of Joshua. And he says this, the Lord rebuke you. That's powerful. When God Almighty rebukes something or someone, that all the heavens tremble. The best way I can put it, all the heavens tremble when the Lord rebukes someone or something, some entity. All the heavens tremble. This is God Almighty. And what's he rebuking? He's rebuking Satan. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Accuser, the Lord rebuke you. He says again, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Jerusalem symbolically represents the people of God. Jerusalem, with all its problems, all its struggles, all its conflicts, all its failures, still the people of God. You and I, Christians, brothers and sisters, with all our conflicts, our problems, our failures, our struggles, still the people of God chosen by God. So the Lord rebukes Satan and then he underlines that by saying, I've chosen Jerusalem. And then he goes on to speak specifically about Joshua. He says, is not this a brand plucked from the fire? A brand is a burning stick. Imagine you've got a bonfire and you pull a burning stick out of that bonfire. If the stick remains in the bonfire, it's going to be destroyed. But you pull it out, that stick is saved. Joshua, he's saying, is a burning stick pulled out of the fire. The fire of sin, the fire of of Satan's destructive ways, pulled out of that. Pulled out for God's purposes. And maybe you too are a burning stick pulled out of the fire. Maybe you too. And this, in rebuking the accuser, God underlines to Satan. He underlines to the accuser. This man standing in front of you, I pulled him out of the fire and I pulled him out for a reason because I love him and I have a purpose for his life and nothing but nothing that you bring against him in the way of accusation is going to change my love for him and his ability to live in the power and the purpose of what I've called him to. That applies to you as well. Sometimes the Satan comes to accuse you and the Lord himself rebukes him. So I want to tie all this together. The Lord sent his greatest rebuke to Satan when he sent Jesus to die on the cross, to pay for all our sins, to break the power of death and to give us new life. That's the greatest rebuke to Satan, to the accuser that the Lord has given. And that's why we go back to that. As the accuser comes against us, we go back to that. We go back to that cross. Thank you, Jesus, that your shed blood means that I'm forgiven. My sins, past, present, future, 
forgiven. I'm clean before you. I'm guiltless before you because of the blood of Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, for the word of my testimony that you've not only saved me and come to live in me, but you've done this for me and you've done this for me and you've done that and you've done this through me. Small or big, thank you that Jesus is with me. And then in the light of all that, whatever it costs, I'm standing on that. I'm going forward in that. Even if all hell is screaming at me that I don't deserve the love of God, that I don't deserve to be strong and firm in him and putting my hand to all the things that he's put before me. Even if all the hell is screaming that, I don't love my life unto death. I don't care about my emotions so much that I'm going to let them dictate how I live and what I do. I don't care about my different comforts so much that I'm going to let them stand in the way of fulfilling his glorious will in my life. So I hope you feel that you've eaten well with these scriptures this morning. I don't want you to have indigestion, so I do encourage you to go back and read them again and just let them soak in, let it digest. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the blood of the Lamb. We thank you for the word of our testimony. We thank you, Lord, that we need not love our life even to death because you've given us eternal life. In every moment, at every point, Lord, eternal life is available to us as we trust you and walk with you, Lord. We pray for our brothers and sisters across the world who are being accused at this time, accused by the devil, accused by human agents of the devil, Lord. We pray for them and we pray, Lord God, that indeed they will conquer him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and loving not their lives, even unto death. And we thank you, Lord, that we all, our brands plucked from the burning. But you have pulled us out of the fire, Lord, and we are with you. The burning continues, Lord. Help us to be used by you to pull other brands out of the fire as well. In Jesus' name, amen.